basically, it's a conversation. You talk to me. Nobody yep. hears my, my questions. Okay. So, you know, the whole idea and your answer is good. You should feel, you know, free to move. And, you know, if you want to gesture, and, and okay. get, that's, all, that's all fine. And there, is, there are no wrong answers because we have the edit room. <laughs> right? Between that's us all. and the finish line. <laughs> right? But if there's something you don't like, you just say, forget it. I, you know. Okay. And up front, we're going to transcribe this. So tell me your name and uh, your role in the Army and where we are formally and, and, and where we are today. Uh, Clinton Romache. Uh, spent almost 12 years in the Army. Started off on uh, the Abrams tank for about the first five years. Uh, the last six and a half, I was a recon cab scout. Uh, got out of the Army as a E6 staff sergeant. Uh, once I got out, I made the transition up to North Dakota to, to work the oil fields up there, and that's where I'm currently at in the, the great cold north. Great. And I will say um, there's a temptation to look over here. <laughs> try and try and try talk and to me. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so. No, <laughs> it was. I'm gonna gonna uh, enlist to do four, and after that one was almost up, it was like, oh well, might as well do another another hitch. And then when that one was almost up, it's like, well, let's do another one. And <laughs> then you know, looking back, it's like, wow, right. well, didn't I ever expect it to stay in more than just a couple of years, kind of do my time and get out. But it just ended up being that way, and. I still, even at that point, I still wasn't even sure if I wanted to make it a career or not, but I, I just really enjoyed, you know, training soldiers and, and taking them overseas and, and that brotherhood and that camaraderie. Uh, that's what really kept me into it. It wasn't thinking, oh, okay, I can get out of the Army when I'm 38 and get a retirement check. It was just being there with the guys. And where do you stay with the same unit pretty much? I mean, uh, what um, consistency was there? I guess when you shifted from the tank, you know, <laughs> end of things to... Like I said, I, I started off in Germany, um, three years there, two tours to Kosovo, was armor the entire time, then I went to Korea, re-enlisted, went to Korea, I was armor there, and we were the fortunate souls that came out of Korea that was already forward deployed to Iraq. So we went straight from Korea to Iraq, and I was still on tanks at that time, uh, for that deployment in 2004 to 2005. But when we got back was when General Sinzeki was kind of making that transition, um, knowing that the, the heavy armor fight wasn't really what the military was really doing anymore, so we wanted more light fighters. So we kind of got voluntold, quite a few of us kind of got voluntold that we were going to reclass to, to scouts, which for me, I, I was happy with. Uh, you know, my grandfather, who I, I just loved to death, when he first came in before World War II, that's what he was, a cab scout, because uh, he was a rodeo man and, you know, breaking the horses and stuff for the Army back then. Uh, so when I got told that, hey, you're going to get reclassed, it was like, okay. And from that point, from the 15 months I was in Korea to coming on deployment to coming back to Fort Carson, I had basically stayed in the unit unit because it got changed that the name got changed a few times for almost six years in the same unit and I you know kind of manipulated the system to you know finally getting the family hauled together in one spot out of Fort Carson and wanting some stability for them I'd kept re-enlisting to stay there so we could have some sort of longevity and, and stability um, and there was shoot there was only me and our mortar platoon sergeants aren't breeding like the two old guards that were the same guys from Korea to the now our third deployment with the unit from start to finish, you know. So it was, it was kind of an interesting uh, dynamic to be in and, and to set in a unit that long, which is really actually very rare in the Army for someone to homestead that long in a combat maneuvering unit. And how many of the guys were consistent through those years? 
Um, by, like I said, by that point, um, it was basically just me and Breeding that was still the only two left from the original Korea guys. Uh, but as far as soldiers went, most of them, you know, you had them for about two years before you kind of turned over. You basically got them for a deployment cycle, a little before, deployed with them, came back for a bit, and then, you know, a lot of the younger guys were just doing their, their quick hitch, uh, their three years or four years, and they were out. So by the time they were done with basic, by the time you got them, by the time you got back, it was time for them to, to ETS, and they were either going off to college or, or off to the civilian world, and then the guys that were staying in longer would pull orders to, to go somewhere else. So unless you re-enlisted like I was doing, they kept getting that guaranteed hideout spot in the unit, you know, they were, you were getting turned over pretty quick. Let me dial back a little bit and talk, get you to talk about your family. Uh, talk to me about where you're from, what your family was like growing up, um, what your father or mother were like. Give me the scene. So I grew up in a really tiny town, which is kind of amazing when you tell people that I grew up in a tiny town in California. And of course, the first thing they ask is, well, how was the beach? I tell them, well, the beach was eight hours away. I grew up on the northeast corner of the state, up in the high uh, Sierra uh, Warner Mountains area. And I grew up in my town of Lake City, where so my family had moved there ever since the, the days of the covered wagon. So we'd been established in that part of California for, shoot, three generations at that point. Um, I came from a town of 100 people. My great-grandmother used to be the, the postmaster slash general store owner slash uh, go-to lady for the, the town gossip. Uh, and then I went to school in a, another town about 10 miles away because, of course, we didn't have a school in my town uh, of Cedarville, which is only about 800 when I was growing up. Uh, I had two older brothers, an older sister, and a younger sister. Uh, granddad had his ranch out in Nevada, which we would visit frequently, normally for the summer times. That's where my place of duty was, was out there with Granddad on, on the ranch for all summer, helping him, me and my uh, two other brothers. Uh, and our family was you know, always really tight. Uh, we'd have brandings you know, in the fall or the spring, and that was our family reunions, was going out there and branding the cows and, and just kind of reconnecting, but you know, doing some manual labor and some hard work. And I was always just so amazed at, you know, my grandfather, especially Grandpa Smith, like I said, old World War II vet. And he was the one that always taught me, he's, you know, little lessons in life. And you never knew you were getting taught a lesson until, like I said, years down the road. And my wife still gives me and my family crap, because when you get us Romache boys together, we don't say a whole lot. And I mean, we could sit there for about six hours and have about eight things said between all of us. And, and granddad was the one that always taught us, you know, don't, you don't have to say a whole lot because for one, when you do open your mouth and say something, people are actually going to listen. Um, and two, you know, if you got to go around and tell everyone how great you are, you're probably not that great because your actions will do that for you. Uh, my dad, you know, he was a Vietnam vet. He didn't talk a whole lot about Vietnam or what he'd experienced. But you could just see that, that sense of pride in everything he did and, and reflecting back to his military experience with us boys. You know, each one of us served. My oldest brother, he went right into the Army as soon as he got out of high school. Second oldest brother went right into the Marines as soon as he got out of high school. And then, of course, when it came my time, I told Dad, hey, that's, you know, you, you've seen my grades. I'm probably not going to go to college right away, so I uh, need to find a, a real job, and I don't want to keep working for you. Uh, fixing fences and milking cows. Um, and I was 17 at the time I graduated. And so dad told me, you know, as I came up to him and asked him if he'd sign early for me. And dad told me, he's like, look, he's like, right now our nation's at peace. We're, we're not really doing a whole lot in the world. And he's like, but there will come a day. It's like, it might not be tomorrow and it might not be in 20 years. But if you sign to to go into the military, know that that day might come that you'll have to go serve and you'll experience and see things that you'll, you'll never forget. Um, 
It's like, so when you turn 18 and you become an adult, you can sign on your own, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it for you. That's gonna be your decision in life to make and yours alone. So day after my birthday, went back to the recruiter. Hey, I'm 18 now, sign me up. And 30 days later, I was shipped off to Fort Knox. And <laughs> I remember coming back to tell my dad that I'd you know, made the decision and I was getting ready to leave. And dad, you know, he was infantry during Vietnam, and that's the only thing he kept telling us boys, whatever you do, don't go into the infantry. You know, get a job, learn a skill, learn a trade. And of course, my oldest brother went infantry. My second oldest brother, when he went to the, uh, the Marines, he wanted to be a diesel mechanic, so dad was pretty happy that Preston wanted to be a diesel mechanic, but unfortunately, every Marine is a, a rifleman. <laughs> so by default, he was, he was infantry, and then when I came up and I told my dad, well, you know, I didn't go infantry, but uh, I'm going armor. Dad looked at me and he was like, why the heck would you do that? Well, he said, don't go infantry. He's like, yeah, but now you're the biggest target on the battlefield. Everyone's going to be gunning for you. So, oh, well, I never really thought of it that way, but at least I don't have to walk anywhere, Dad. He's like, oh, yeah, sure. So you think. <laughs> um, you know, and it was just great to come from that small community, that a small town where everybody knew each other and said we had generation of family history up there and and you know I was just so proud to to be around my dad and my grandfather uh, you know that taught me those life lessons and those skills of just be a man of your word just do your job um, and just be who you are what is the Actually, you don't need to sleep. Clint, you can, you can not do this late. Just quiet. Oh. <laughs> well, let us, you know, work hard to bring that sleep. Maybe it's still a little bit. <laughs> so, um, it, just a curiosity, Ramache, what's the national origin of Ramache? Um, I've been told that it's French, but my nationality comes from uh, Scottish uh, and English descent. Romache got picked up after my dad's parents had divorced and his mom got remarried. Uh, but it was uh, originally McCowan and uh, Smith is oh, where I come from. Because it's kind of a unique name. I mean, Romache, I don't I, I, <laughs> Yeah. We, we used to use it to screen uh, phone calls at home when uh, telemarketers would call because they mispronounced the name. It's like, oh, no, they're not here. <laughs> right. sense the idea of, of going into the military was was pretty much always on your mind from I mean I remember for a little bit growing up when I was really young I wanted to be a paleontologist and then I remembered I can't even spell paleontologist so how could I spell the names of half the dinosaurs out there uh, but yeah from the get that's all I just I just wanted to serve I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do but I just and I wanted to follow the tradition of, of my family and, and just do my part to give back to this great country. And uh, so you, it sounds like you're pretty close to your grandfather. Yeah, we were very close. You know, it was, like I said, every summer was out there helping him. And I want you to include your grand, granddad or whatever in your answer, so they won't hear my answer. <laughs> I mean, like I said, me and Grandpa Smith, I mean, every summer, was out there for almost 18 years of my life. Every summer out there with him in, in the ranch in Nevada. And like I said, Grandpa Smith was just, he was old school. Uh, I mean, there was no electricity out there. There was no, definitely no cell phone service. Everything ran off either propane for the lights at night. Um, the water heater was plumbed through the, the wood stove that we did our cooking on. And it was just a, a simpler time. and. You know, just sitting there and working the fields and, and raising the alfalfa and out there shooting squirrels and, you know, just, just being around him and just watching him just, you know, used to give him, used to give him a lot of crap because would tear down one of his old buildings or something and he would pull every nail out and re-straighten them. And he still, 
there's still buckets. Grandma still complains about the buckets and nails that granddad would never throw one away. He'd just straighten them back out because he thought he was going to use them someday. Uh, and to see that thriftiness and just, you know, that's what this nation was founded on. Granddad had, you know, went through the Depression as a small child, and he understood the value of maintaining and, and keeping things and, and being a man of his word. Um, and those were some of the greatest lessons I ever got taught was just be a man of your word. And, you know, when you, when you leave this world, the only thing you leave behind is, is the family name. And how do you want people to think of that when you're, when you're gone? And that really resonates with you when you kind of put things into perspective. I guess he passed away. He uh, passed in 2007 on my uh, second Iraq deployment. Um, talk to me about the church. W weren't you actively involved at the, the uh, Church of the Latter-day Saints? I, I grew up Mormon. Uh, like I said, that's originally what kind of brought our, our family to that neck of the woods was uh, on my, my mom's side. Uh, uh, my mom's side, they got converted out of England when the uh, Mormon missionaries were over there. And brought them to, uh, they first kind of settled in uh, oh, uh, Tennessee, and then they took the covered wagons and were headed west. Um, and I grew up in the church. You know, my family was all, all Mormons. Grew up in the church. Uh, and in high school, I went to a seminary every morning before school. So for four years, I had seminary uh, studying scriptures. And my parents... <laughs> My parents really had high hopes that I was going to be the one son that actually went on a mission. Uh, and, I, and I think both my parents would vouch for me on this. I, I was the best kid they had, hands down. I never got into trouble like my older brothers, or at least I never got caught. Um, and, you know, like I said, I was going to get done with high school, and I was kicking around the idea of doing my service for the church and, and going on a mission. But there was also, at that time, you, you couldn't go on your mission until you're 21. So I was like, well, I'm 18, and I can do the military for a while, and then when I get back, maybe, I'll, maybe that's when I'll do it. And ended up, you know, just staying in the, the Army. But, uh, you know, the church showed me a lot of great values and, and, and instilled a lot, of, a lot of great things in us. Um, and just so appreciative of that, to have kind of a, a sense of, morality and a, a good moral compass, uh, understanding that there's, there's things out there more than just yourself, and you're not going at it alone. And is your family uh, still practicing? Yep. Yeah. I'm, like I said, I've kind of fallen off the wagon <laughs> a little more than probably what I should, but, you know, my dad still, still tries to get me reconnected, and it's just one of those, maybe the timing isn't right, or maybe I'm just being lazy. <laughs> Talk to me about uh, your experience with 9/11. What was? Where were you? What, how did you find out about it? I was in a. I was stationed in Vilsack, Germany. Um, I want to make sure that you include 9/11 in your in your answer. Yeah, I, I was stationed in Vilsack, Germany. Uh, we were uh, in the field at the time, and I believe it was called Training Area Bravo, just outside of our motor pool there. And we'd been doing uh, tank maneuvers all day. And shoot, it was around 3 or 4 in the afternoon, and we get a call across the radio. The uh, battalion commander wants to see everybody. He gave us a grid for our assembly area. He um, said, hey, everyone pull up, park motor pool style. I got something, you know, I need to talk to you guys about something. And, of course, you know, we'd been in the field for the all day and actually we'd been there the night before um and when you heard that come across the radio you're kind of thinking to yourself well who got in trouble because normally you never set up as they call it motor pool style out during uh combat training maneuvers so you're kind of thinking well all right well someone get hurt or someone get in trouble this is kind of odd so the uh the battalion all stage online we start forming up by uh by companies. 
people are kind of talking and I mean no one no one has a clue what's going on and our uh, battalion commander comes out and he asks the uh, the formation is there anybody here that lives in uh, New York City or has family in New York City a few of the guys put their hands up told them to come here pulled them out of formation seen him kind of take him around the side of his uh, side of his tank and you could see him sitting there talking something to him and you see a cell phone come out hands it to him and they're there for a little bit and the colonel comes back over the front of formation and says hey boys we don't know all the details yet but uh they just flew two planes into the world trade center and he's like from this day forward our our country is going to change, and our mission is going to change, boys. So know that everything you do from here on out, it's not going to be the same country it was yesterday. Um, at that point, uh, told us to get back on our tanks. They were bringing some hot chow out, and uh, we're going to roll, pick up ammo, and we're going to lock the base down. Uh, we. Got a little bit of food. A couple of the tanks pushed off to the ammo supply point, picked up live ammo, uh, and we pushed out on the perimeter of Vilsack, Germany. We locked the base down for almost a week and a half. Um, some of the families, you know, they wouldn't let anybody on post and they wouldn't let anybody off. We had guys sleeping, you know, on the floor in our, uh, our uh, company areas uh, for about a week straight. Uh, the guys in the barracks, you know, were bringing down sleeping bags and stuff for for some of the some of the guys that lived off post that couldn't get off post to get changed or anything. Uh, and then finally they started letting up, and you know we got back and was finally able to start watching some of the the video of of what had happened and coming to understand that it yeah at first you kind of thought it was just maybe a fluke accident. Once they uh, confirmed that second plane had hit the towers, we knew something was was going down. And, so uh, this was a week later or something. How long was it before you saw the images? It was about four days after, because we were, like I said, pushed out on perimeter for a while. We're pulling 12 on and 12 off. And, and I, yeah, it was almost three or four days before I walked back into the battalion area where we had a TV there, um, where they were watching the videos or kind of the replays and that was the first time I got to see it you know and it's like holy crap this is this happened but <laughs> we got to do something about it right. and I want to make sure I, sure you know when 9-11 you know we yeah. come in with when 9-11 Basically, that's kind of the routine here. You're mm -hmm. a great storyteller, but we don't have half an hour. Yeah. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back occasionally and to I'm condense. Sure. Yeah. So, just talk to me about 9/11 and, and finding out about it and why it was so why it was so upsetting, so intense for you personally. You know, when 9/11 uh, happened, like I said, it was one of those. You know, before that, our big deployments was Kosovo. Um, really kind of thought that we as a country were pretty much untouchable. Um, and when we said when we were in the field and got that call to rally up and, and got the word that we had two planes fly into the towers, one hit the Pentagon and one was in the field in Pennsylvania, and our uh, battalion commander telling us that, look, boys, from this day forward, it's our world has changed, um, and we need to be ready for it. Just, <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things that you just never thought could happen to us. And it, it was also kind of sobering to understand, though, that you never seen the nation unite quite like that before in my life. At a, such a tragic event, 
so much good could come out of neighbors helping neighbors and a sense of pride and patriotism that this country had really been lacking for, for a while. <laughs> the flyover. <laughs> You know, it's it's unfortunate to have any tragedy like that happen, but it's it's amazing and just awe-inspiring to see what this nation can do in the face of of something like that. How they regroup, and I mean, we've got a history. This nation has got a history of of taking horrible events and making the best of it and pushing forward and continuing on. It was sort of a little bit like what your father had predicted when you were back when you were <laughs> 17. There was going to come a time when... Yeah. I mean, when Dad had told me that, you know, like I said, the big thing going on with, was Kosovo. Uh, it was just, you know, a young kid never wants to listen to their, their dad. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things that, oh, I... I know better than you. I'm, I've been on this world for only 17 years, Dad. I, I think I've got this. And when I reflected back on what happened during September 11th and what Dad had told me about that day might come, you know, I understood that, well, this is what I signed up to do. Um, and I made the choice as a man, and I knew with both eyes wide open that this was a possibility, which I think has always helped me along the way understanding that at any given time um, you will see and, and, and experience things that you probably shouldn't, but having that prior preparedness and that kind of mental rehearsal uh, has helped me out to, to face things. I had done uh, two deployments to Iraq and, and one to Afghanistan. Uh, like I said, my first deployment was 2004 to 2005. My second deployment to uh, Iraq was 2006 to 2008. And then my Afghanistan deployment was 2009 to 10. Did you know much about Afghanistan before you got there? We had truly lucked out in uh, my platoon because Sergeant Kirk uh, came to us uh, I think about six months before we deployed, Sergeant Kirk had just been stationed in that exact same area of Nuristan, um, the Fob Bostic area, on his last deployment. <clears throat> and I knew, I knew Afghanistan was. Yeah, I'm sorry, save oh. for a second. <laughs> Not New York, but you know, <laughs> we're trying. Just like, you know, some dark, <laughs> nasty place. Oh my God. So, you're saying Sergeant Kirk had some experience? Yeah, Sergeant Kirk had just got back from his last appointment from that exact area. And, I, you know, I'd been to Iraq twice. Um, when I was in Iraq, I started actually doing more reading and studying than I ever did in, in high school. So I had a pretty good concept of the history of Iraq and the U.S. relations with that, that area. But Afghanistan was one of those, you know, never really put too much thought into that, that part of the world. But to have Sergeant Kirk with us, you know, he really gave us, you, you sat through the briefings and, and you heard about the intel reports, you know, and you, you got shown the PowerPoint slide presentations and, and this and that, but to have Sergeant Kirk, you know, that first-hand account, that direct experience that was, he had already went through for the last year prior to coming to us in the exact same spot we were going back, you know, really helped us adapt our platoon training um, to getting guys used to hiking up and down mountains and, 
you know, angle fire and making sure that uh, for our, our vehicles, our cruiser weapons were modified to mount so you could go straight vertical with it. Um, and just the, the way the locals interacted with you, having Kirk tell us about very, how in that part of Afghanistan, they were very tribal and you can't just walk into a village and think you're gonna get any sort of a welcome there unless they want you there. Um, like I said, really gave us a leg up when we finally hit, hit ground and put boots on the ground up there. You know what he had been telling us, we could put it into direct practical use right off the bat. He have pictures? He, uh, he didn't have pictures that he was showing us there at the, uh, um, at the SNAs prior to going. Uh, I know he had pictures, but it was one of those, you know, that was, that was his pictures, you know, yeah. for him and his experience. Right. Is this, uh, lab, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, is that, are they vacuuming next door or something? Is that that sound or is that, I mean, it seems uh, kind of consistent. So that, I, well, that's, that's the noise that we were trying to get rid of earlier. Steady. It's fine. Okay. Steady. Okay. I, I think it's. I think we'd be able to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, uh huh. That's we, fine. We will get some yeah. intel. So, so talk to me about arriving at Command Outpost Two, and what what your impressions were, what it looked like. Just give me that. You know, when uh, we first arrived, uh, I said we'd gotten the briefings. We'd been. I'm going to ask you to include at Keating. Okay. okay. Yeah. You know, when we first arrived at Cop Keating, I said we'd gotten all the briefings about what kind of an area it was, uh, what kind of a position it was. But it wasn't until, like I said, that, that first night we got there to Cop Keating on the Chinook um, and got off the bird that night. We were met by the unit we were replacing that kind of got us off the LZ and, and took us up um, into the camp and you're trying to look around with your night vision to try and get a sense of where you were. Uh, kind of understood that, okay, this was just as crappy as they, they talked about in the, the, the mission briefs and the intel reports. But it wasn't until that next morning when the sun came up, walked outside, and just remember just looking straight up in four different directions and just thinking, what the hell? Who would put this thing here? Um, when you read the, the military doctrine of defensible positions, this was the exact opposite. You know, we were all the way in the bottom of a valley. Um, there was high ground all around us. Uh, our, our living conditions and, and the whole setup of the, the outpost was very primitive. Uh, there was a lot of talk about closing it down or or uh, keeping it going and so as far as logistic supplies you know they're halfway on the fence so they didn't quite want to send you what you really needed um, but they didn't want to just give you nothing uh, so a lot of times when you'd request extra wire or, or sandbags you'd only get about a third of what you needed um, but what was really more amazing was you know, when the, the soldiers got there, because um, myself, the platoon sergeant, Sergeant Guerrero and Lieutenant Bunderman, we were the first three there out of my platoon for the leader's recon and, and kind of the handover with the, uh, the unit we were replacing. But when our soldiers started showing up, I mean, you could see it in their face too, that they knew this was a pretty crappy spot. But you're just so amazed that they didn't sit there and bitch about it. They didn't sit there and you know, hack on, well, why the hell are we here? Why the heck, you know, who would do this to us? They looked at it and they, they made the best of a really crappy situation. And they just, you know, with all the, the grit in the world, understood they had a job to do. And they understood that, you know, we're, we're the soldiers on the ground. We don't make the decisions on where we get put. We get put there and we make the best out of out of bad stuff. Um, and there's nothing more inspiring than, than to see that firsthand from young kids, you know, 18, 19, 20 year old kids that could easily be, you know, at a kegger party in college 
at that point in their life if they wanted to, but they decided to serve their country and they decided to go to a spot not of their choosing, but because out of service. Um, they were gonna go there with their brothers. They were gonna make the best of, of, of a situation. And what was, did your, did your mission involve connecting supposedly with the, with the locals? And how was, was that really happening? And talk to me about it. You know what was possible. What was really happening when you were there? Um, our mission at out of Cop Keating was was to maintain stability in the in, in the region where we're at. The problem was we were just underpowered. Um, we didn't have the the troop strengths to be able to pull our own security and then push out very far uh, with the maneuvering element. Typically, most of the time, you're only pushing out of the wire with about eight to 10 US forces. So you knew if you got in trouble, you only had about eight to 10 guys that were gonna come help you. Um, and that really limited our battle space on how far we could push which then in turn limited how much interaction we could do with the, the locals. We had the, the village Armul said right outside of our gate. And we had, you know, some pretty good interaction with them. But it was also one of those the, the Nuristan Providence of Afghanistan was unfortunately one of those areas that the the main government of Afghanistan didn't really give two hoots about. Uh, the only reason they wanted to keep their name on it was they didn't want Pakistan to have it. And Pakistan really didn't care about it other than they just wanted it so Afghanistan couldn't, couldn't claim it. Um, and we were the only U.S. or the only coalition forces in that whole providence. Um, and the status quo was in, in political support of Afghanistan and Nuristan will keep a presence there. And that's what it felt like more often than not, that we were just kind of a, a chess piece that was set there on the table to hold just a, a piece of terrain. Did you um, and your guys envision um, the type of attack that finally, finally came down on you? You know, we were, we were there for three months before the, the attack happened. <laughs> I remember multiple nights sitting out in front of the barracks, myself and Sergeant Gallegos and Sergeant Kirk, and Sergeant Larson, and Lieutenant Bunderman and Braz. And we would game plan, hey, if we're gonna attack us, how, how would we do it? And from that, we tried to develop things that we could, we could counter it with. You know, kind of playing these war games in our heads of, you know, hey, first thing we'd like to do is we'd suppress our mortar positions. If we can't fire the mortars, that gives them an easier, uh, an easy avenue of approach because our mortars was really our lifeline uh, for getting direct fire up in the mountains. Uh, then we talked about clearing out the vill village of Armul and having straight direct shots into our uh, western perimeter. Um, and then being able to, to run straight down the lock through the front gate. Um, and when, it, when the battle kicked off, that's exactly what they did. They did everything we talked about, how we would do it. Um, but it was good to sit there and pick the brain of your guys and kind of get everyone involved, especially the, the team leaders and stuff, and get them seeing what our vulnerabilities were and to get them thinking about, well, if something ever did happen, what could we do to kind of increase our chances? Um, like I said, it's taking one of those crappy situations and just making the best out of it. Um, like I said, there's nothing greater to watch than that, than, than taking a challenge and just throwing it on your shoulder and not even having doubt in your mind that, hey, we can, we can make good stuff still happen.
time of the attack, what were the numbers that you, in terms of your troops and what you projected or saw or was counted coming at you when you ran ahead of them? That, that morning, uh, October 3rd, when the attack kicked off, I mean, we were already in country for three months. We had already started doing our our R and R leave for our guys, um, and when you started the the rest and relaxation cycle, I mean, you were losing out of one platoon four guys at a time for up to a month, and in a 21 man platoon, when you lose four guys for a month, that's that's a big number. Um, you know, total that day, we had a, about 52. Had uh, two Latvian soldiers, and 50 American soldiers. We had a, I want to say about 30 Afghan Army uh, soldiers on the eastern side. Uh, but when it first kicked off, they kind of found other places to be. Uh, so right off the bat, our, our whole eastern flank was totally exposed. Um, when the first rounds came in, I, like I said, I was, I was still sleeping at the time, about six in the morning. And as soon as you heard those rounds come in, you know, we'd gotten attacked on a pretty regular basis. And you kind of got used to, to hearing the incoming normally around that time in the morning. But this time you just knew it was, you know, a whole different ball game. Uh, and remember the first time after I threw my gear on, turned my radio on, and ran out to uh, where Specialist Copus was uh, on the Humvee, just outside our talk on the, the eastern end. I remember seeing Copus up on the gun, just going to town, and calling out targets, and I'm hearing Sergeant Gallegos on the western flank. He's talking to the platoon leader in the, the tactical operations center, and he's calling out targets. And you're just hearing explosion after explosion and, and bullets wh whizzing by, and two soldiers, uh, Danley and, and Jones, that was out there with Copus, and they had a machine gun up to help cover Copus but they had no cover themselves to really protect them. And I remember telling those boys to get their, their butts back inside um, to, to find a little better cover. And it just seemed everywhere you're looking up in the mountains, you were seeing movement. Um, everywhere you're walking or dodging, I should say, uh, on the cop, I mean, you were having rounds just every which way coming in at you. So they were hitting us with the indirect fires, the mortars, and the, the RPGs. And, I mean, explosions were just, just constant, uh, almost like a drum solo, just one right after another. Um, and it was one of those kind of things that muscle memory started taking over. Um, and I knew we had the, the guys on their perimeter doing everything in their power to beat them back off, and they were just doing their job. And I was like, well, now it's got to do mine. I'm not, I don't want to let any of those guys down there. They're right there in the heart of the fight. You know, what can we do to support them? Um, and, you know, I kept going back and forth with Gallegos and Lieutenant Bunderman about trying to get close air support in and trying to get the, the artillery in, you know, and they'd like I said, pinned our mortars down right away. O.P. Fritchie that sat just uh, on the mountaintop to the south of us, they had attacked them at the exact same time. So O.P. Fritchie was, you know, they had their, their hands full with their fight up top and, and they couldn't support us. Um, so the, the first two uh, Apaches came in uh, and the enemy had put anti-aircraft guns up on the mountain waiting for the close air support. Uh, so you knew these weren't your your spray and pray typical, you know what what a lot of people think just hill fighting yahoos. These guys were very well trained, very well organized. In hindsight, we knew they had been probing us for months on those little, little attacks to see where our kind of soft spots in the defense was. Um, and you knew they they were coming at you in something they believed, that they weren't just going to sit there and if you gained fire superiority, they were going to break contact and leave. These guys were committed to uh, totally 
taken us all the way out. Um, but at a, a certain point, you know, time stood still, and then time just slipped on by without notice. Um, and certain things just, you know, it, it seemed like it took forever to do something. And on the same token, it didn't seem like it took any time because a lot of times when I'd be running back and forth, getting reports uh, from the perimeters and heading out to uh, Copas's position, I just kind of would show up there. Don't know how I'd get there. He just kind of showed up and it's like, oh, I just ran all the way from there. Didn't, didn't get shot yet, that's pretty good. Um, so it was, it was just kind of interesting to see that. Um, I don't know if you'd call it a defense mechanism in your brain, kind of blocking things out or, or what. Well, you had this, uh, you had some special training in you know, forward re reconnaissance and, you know, it's, and, and leadership you know, oh. training. Does that kind of training play into you know, like this or? Train, you know, a lot of the, you know, the anti armors leaders school, uh, school I went to, the scout leaders course I went to, you know, that's all, that's all good base material to, to build experience on, but really I think the best I, I had for training was the previous two deployments. Having that actual, you know, on the ground, being in firefights before, uh, that was, was one of the things I always kind of like doing with the, the new guys in country. To try and explain to them what the difference of being shot at is and being shot at is. You know, there's close and then there's, there's close. And to kind of see them for the first time have a, a round come by and, oh, that was that at us? And I was like, oh, no, that was, that was at us, but that wasn't at us. And then a little while later, another one come by and then you see the look in their face and I'm like, that's at us. <laughs> um, and I'm a, I'm a firm believer that, you know, you can do all the training you want and it'll, it'll build a good base for you back stateside or, or wherever your training area is, but it's really that on the ground experience that you can't simulate um, that really made it a little more familiar to be in that situation and to understand kind of what was really at risk and what was at stake. How did you start to assess how to deal with the, the greatest, I mean, to, to make the move. In, in, in part, it was to try and get to Gallegos, right, and, his, and the guys who were stuck in the... You know, like I said, uh, half the time I don't even know what I was thinking. It just kind of felt like, it just felt like it was the right thing to do, or felt like it was the choice to make. Um, Initially, when Gallegos was, uh, when they were up there on that western flank in that Humvee and they basically exhausted all their ammunition, um, they were just sitting there just taking, taking a beating. And I went into the barracks and I grabbed Specialist Gregory and we tried to sneak up and around with a machine gun to give him support. Um, started engaging with the machine gun and shortly thereafter uh, the enemy had flanked us, came through the front gate and fired the RPG into the generator we were using as cover. Um, had to displace back after that and it was one of those if we don't get up to Gallegos or get them out of there they ain't gonna make it. And so when Sergeant Hart came into the barracks I want, to, I want to stay for a second with this first phase, and your so you and uh, I'm sorry, your S specialist escape. Yeah, ready. The th uh, were you going by the Shura building? Where, where? What was your route back towards the? Uh, and and where did you talk to me about? What you you know you had a machine gun right and talk to me about what was happening around you. We were uh, like I said at that point I was getting reports in from Gallegos. Uh, 
that their 50 cal had been disabled, that they were almost out of ammunition. Um, they, they were just taking an overwhelming volume of fire. Um, and I was bouncing back and forth between the aid station where uh, Sergeant Kirk was getting worked on and, and Specialist uh, Copas, who had the only, basically at that point, the only gun left in the fight, uh, guarding our eastern, eastern flank. Um, so I just, I came into the barracks to assess who we still had and what we still had. <coughs> and seeing Gregory sitting there and he had his, his Mark 48 machine gun um, and a couple belts of ammunition. Um, I asked him, he's like, hey, come with me. I asked him, is that all the ammo you had? And he's like, yeah, I'm only down to about 200 rounds. And me kind of being the selfish guy I am and kind of a little better shot than Gregory is with the machine gun, I, I took the machine gun from him and told him to, to be my assistant gunner to, to feed me the bullets. So we came out of our barracks kind of to the, the eastern exit and we snuck around the side of our barracks and up the, the little alley uh, where we had a, a little local mosque for some of the, uh, the locals that worked on the, uh, the outpost um, where they could attend their services. But it was just a, a kind of a flimsy wooden structure. I was able to sneak around that. And the way our barracks was set up with some of the HESCOs in the ditching, the drainage ditch, we were then able to get behind the moss, follow the ditch, and then come up around where our generator sat, the 60K generator. From that position, we could open up and see the whole western side. Looking over the top of Gallegos, we could see the mortar pit. We could see down to the Shura building, but we didn't have a, a good enough angle to see through the front gate. And honestly, at that time, I, I, I did not know that the, uh, the front gate, the Shura, had already been overran. Um, that the, uh, the forces on there had to uh, displace back because they couldn't hold the, the ground anymore. Uh, but looking into the village Armol directly across the west where Gallegos and, and the, the five other guys there um, set the machine gun up and started looking in the mountains and you could just see guys all over, guys set up in machine gun nest positions and, and the muzzle flashes and the, the snipers coming out of the, the moss tower and, and the village Armol. So I keyed the net and started talking to guy. Ego said, hey, I've been able to sneak over here. I've, me and Greg got a, got a machine gun. I've got about 200 rounds. I told him I'm just gonna start dumping. I'm gonna try and put enough suppressive fire down and if you guys can make your move, hey, come back here. Guy Ego said, okay. Um, started engaging, got about the first hundred rounds out. Was doing a change, Gregory's loading me another belt. The entire time, Gallegos is calling back and it's like, you just, you can't bring enough firepower. It's like, you, there's just too many of them. Um, we can't move, They're, you just can't, you know, you can't suppress them all at once. Kept calling him back and telling him, look, if you, if you can move at all, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep him down, but if you can move at all, hey, try and displace. And it just kind of conversation kept going back and forth, you know, on the, on the radio, on the gun. And then uh, I said it was one of those things I tried to teach my guys when you're, when you're in a firefight. You never want to put the blinders on. You never want to get the, the narrow vision, um, but that's what I was doing is I was looking directly to the west up in the switchbacks and going from uh, target to target. My enemy was able to flank around and come through the front gate on us and uh, set up an RPG and fired it right into the generator we were using. And, and luckily, it was a pretty stout generator because it took the majority of the blast. Blew me over onto to Gregory I remember looking at him and picking him up after I got off him and giving him a quick, quick pat down and asking if he was okay. And he said, yep, I think I'm good. So I told him, hey, just take off running. 
I'll cover you. I called Gallegos back, and I'm like, hey, brother, I, I can't hold this position anymore. Uh, they got me zeroed in. I'm almost out of ammo. Um, said something to the effect of, we'll try and regroup and come back at you. Gallegos came back. He said, well, we'll, we'll be here waiting. Gregory was able to displace back. I basically used up the, the rest of the ammunition. I was able to make it back and handed the, uh, the machine gun back over to Gregory. Um, that's when uh, Sergeant Rasmussen came up to me and he looked at me and he asked if I was all right. <laughs> I told him, yeah, I think, well, I think I'm fine, I'm good. And, he looks down at my arm and he's like, dude, you, you've got a hole in your arm. I look and it's like, yep, <laughs> crap. And I move my hand and I'm like, well, I can still still walk, talk, and, and then shoot. I'm, I'm still good. But he grabs my uh, pressure dressing out of my medical bag and my medical pouch and throws it on my forearm and starts sto you know, stops the bleeding and gets it bandaged up. And, I go back into the aid station, you know, trying to get an assessment on Kirk, and I'm back in the barracks trying to figure out who we still have left, how our ammo situation's looking. Go into the, the talk and to go see my PL to figure out what the status of the close air support is. And by then, I'm finally noticing that I can't feel my hand anymore, losing movement in it. As I'm sitting there and I'm talking to my platoon leader, I'm, I keep looking down and I keep trying to, to get my hand to move. I'm thinking the worst. And first Sergeant comes over, First Sergeant Burton comes over, says, are you all right? And I'm like, well, yeah, I got, got hit in the arm. And I was like, I, I thought I was good, but I'm starting to lose feeling in it. I don't know what's going on. So First Sergeant Burton looks at it and he starts unwrapping the dressing and he said, who, who the hell put this on you? I said, well, Raz did. And he said, well, was he putting a tourniquet on you? Because he, he cinched this thing down so tight. And when he finally, after he got a few of the wraps off, I could finally feel the blood start coming back down to my hand and could start moving it again. Um, first Sergeant kind of readjusted it with not quite so much pressure on me. Um, then I realized that, you know, Gallegos was still, still out there. And, went back into our barracks and I remember seeing Sergeant, Sergeant Stanley and Sergeant Hart and they're going back and forth about something. So I walk up and Stanley looks over at me and kind of shakes his head and he says, Hart, talk to Roe, see what he thinks. Hart came up to me and he's like, hey Sergeant Roe, hey, we found some more 50 cal ammo. I want to take a couple of guys, I think we can get up to that that other Humvee, uh, we can reload that 50 and we can push over to, to Gallegos. And I told Hart, and I'm like, brother, I just got blown off the generator. Um, I can't protect anything to the right of you. We, we can't set in that, that north flank security. We just kept kind of going back and forth, and I, I realized that looking at Hart and Listening to Hart, there, there was nothing I was going to ever say to him that was going to get him to change his mind and, and not think about taking that Humvee to go get Gallegos. And I just knew that, you know, there was, there was no telling him no. He was going to do it, and he knew what he was getting into. So I told him, hey, you know, tell me your plan once again. What, do you, what are you thinking? He said, well, I'll take two guys. Take Faulkner and, and Griffin. Um, we'll sneak up to the Humvee. We'll reload that 50. I'm going to pu push on the southern side of the camp. We'll come up next to Gallegos with a moving Humvee. We'll either get them in and load them out, or, or they can use it for a, for a shield. I told Hart, OK, you'll make it happen. Hart left out the, the back door and I 
I knew that was going to be the last time I ever seen him. But I, I, I knew he was, he knew if there was any chance at all, even the slightest one, he was going to risk everything for it. You know, and it's one of those things that you just, you know, you can't change the past, but to go in with full determination of nothing more than just trying to help someone. Didn't give a crap about what happened to him. He just wanted to get Gallegos and those guys out of there. Sort of a parallel to what you had just said. <laughs> right, you're describing uh, a kind of <clears throat> you could call it heroic, you could call it selfless commitment. What there was, this is what was going through your your mind too, right? I mean, this is what you had done in your first attempt to take that machine gun up there. You know, it was it was one of those things, like I said, that the plan wasn't solid. You know, I knew it. You know, that's the trouble I got into is I couldn't. Even if I had someone else there, you couldn't cover the flanks enough, well enough to make a maneuver like that. And that's what I tried to stress to heart. But like I said, there was, there was no telling him no. And it was one of those, there was a chance in hell. I'm going to risk everything just to help, just to do a, something. Um, and it was at that point, you know, it was getting, it was getting to the point of, we got to do something. We can't just sit here and keep taking it. We can't just sit here and and just and wait for something to happen. Um, so after that heart pushed up into position, guy goes the entire time is is screaming at heart on the radio, "Hey, brother, don't come up here! Don't come up here! You're, you're doing nothing but drawing drawing fire. Let's go back." Heart kept pushing and. And the call comes across the radio, hey, they've got an RPG pointed right at me. Radio silent. Realize that they are, the enemy is taken over the front gate, pushed all the way into our wire. Uh, you know, we were at that point, we had only, we owned about a 50 meter circle. Basically our, our aid station, our tactical operations center, and uh, our first platoon, our, our platoon's barracks. About the only things we physically controlled at that point. Um, so when Hart came in with that last radio transmission of they got an RPG pointed right at us, we thought all of them were gone up there. So the call went out that we were gonna, knowing we had radios exposed and unaccounted for, knowing that we were about to try and coordinate to do something, we uh, switched our frequencies. So if the enemy had a radio, they couldn't listen in to kind of the, the plan we were gonna start up with. At that point, that's when uh, went back into the aid station for the last time to see if Kirk had made it. And I got Corville, our, our medic, and I walked in. You know, I gave him the thumbs up or thumbs down just because you couldn't really hear anything anyways with everything going on, and he gave me the thumbs down, so I knew we'd lost Kirk. Knew that we had uh, lost heart, 
pretty sure we'd lost Hart and we lost Gallegos and and Larson and and Mace and Martin and and Carter. Wasn't sure about the mortars. Uh, was pretty sure they might still be be alive up there, but kind of doubted it also. As I was getting ready to leave the aid station, there was a wounded uh, Afghan army soldier in there. He had a Russian sniper rifle that he was, he was carrying. And at this point, I figured, well, that shoots a much bigger bullet than uh, my M4 does. We're almost out of ammunition anyways, so might as well start grabbing what we can and utilizing it. Grab the sniper rifle. At this point, Copus kept calling up that he was getting pinned down pretty hard from a sniper from his, his backside he was facing south into the east and he was taking fire from the north. So I grabbed the rifle, was able to run around the aid station, make it out to his position. And he's just up there in the turret and I remember kind of looking up to him and he's hunkered down as low as he can so he can keep firing but you know, trying to keep his head down so that he doesn't take one from the guy behind him. Kind of looked up at him and I'm like, hey, you know we're gonna die here, right? I kind of chuckled at him. He kind of looked at me and I'm like, hey, this fucking, I was like, you're the only gun left in the fight. You've got to hold this. So I started bouncing back and forth from the front side of the Humvee to the back, uh, playing cat and mouse with the shooter behind him. Come to the front try to search for him and I'd fire a few rounds to try and get his attention. Then I'd get him to try and come out for a bit to try and get him to shoot. Then I'd come on the backside so I could try and pick him up. Kept going back and forth for a couple of times. Finally got him to, to quiet down and silenced him off. And Kind of gave the update again to Copus. Hey, you need you need to hold this position. Um, I'll be back for you. Uh, but just hang tight, hang what you got. And what vehicle is he in? He's in a, a Humvee right outside of Third Platoon's barracks. I uh, got a Mark 19 up there, a fully automatic grenade launcher. Uh, and that's you know also when he told me he's like, hey, I'm. I don't know how long I can hold it. I'm almost out of ammunition. I realized you know. They breached the front gate. They pushed all the way up on us. We couldn't even get to the ammo. You know, the guys we still had left there, kind of in that what we ended up calling the Alamo position, we were all almost out of ammo. So I came back around, was able to make the dash, linked up with Lieutenant Bunderman at Sergeant Hill. Sergeant Hill was the uh, third platoon platoon sergeant. I told him, hey, we gotta take this bitch back. Um, we can't stand here and just keep taking this. I told him I'm gonna go into the barracks, see who's in there, ask for a group, whoever I can get. We're gonna push up to the ammo supply point. We're gonna retake that, because uh, we don't have any bullets left to fight we're not going to be fighting much longer so that's that's critical we get, we got to get ammo pushed back so that after that uh i'm going to push around recapture the sure building and shut the front gate so they can't just keep rolling in on us and the front gate is on the north side yeah it's on the, the north side of the camp um kind of pointing up the uh they called it the lock or the river and the road or lines of communication ran. Uh, so the, the main road actually could drive straight into our, our front gate. Um, had good covered and concealed routes along our, our uh, western wall too to get up into the front gate area. So uh, yeah, I told Munderman and Lieutenant Munderman and Sergeant Hill that you know we'd take the ammo supply point back, we'll take the shirt building back, we'll close the front gate, if we can make it up there. Uh, we'll push up eventually to the mortar position 
and, and see what we can find on the way. On the way was Gallegos and Yeah, the, the five guys we'd, you know, were unaccounted, unaccounted for at that point. Um, no more radio contact. Yeah, we'd, we'd switch frequencies, thought they'd all gotten overran. Um, Faulkner, who uh, went up there with, with Hart, was able to somehow make it back. Uh, he was pretty pretty badly wounded. So we tried to try to talk to him about what had conspired or what it, what it kind of looked like up there. But he was kind of in a, in a daze of one, you know, surviving the blast and then two somehow making that that dash all the way back in open terrain. So <clears throat> kind of had this, like I said, just harebrained idea, this plan that uh, freaking counterattack is what we're going to do. Um, why not? Walked in the barracks and remember kind of just looking around and I forgot how many guys we had in there, but that was you know one of the final holding spots. And uh, a couple of them basically got told just to point their barrels at the, the door and if uh, an unfriendly came in unannounced, that's basically where they're just going to stand and, and fight the last fight. So I walked in there and kind of seen this. And I said, hey, I need, I need some guys. I need some volunteers. We're, we're going to take this bitch back. Got five guys stand up. Raz, Delaney, Danley, Sergeant Miller, and Jones. I mean, without, without hesitation or without thought. Didn't even, at that point, they didn't even know what the plan was, other than we're going to take this bitch back. So I kind of got them huddled around, and I told them, look, we need to go get more ammo. That's our first move. We'll push up there, get the ammo supply point back. We'll hold the terrain. Blue platoon is going to try and maneuver a uh, support by fire uh, for us so we can kind of cover each other's move as we do this. But we need to get the ammo back. So like after that, we'll go shut the front gate, and after that, we'll clear up through to see if we can find who we can find and get up to the mortar position. So just to see the, just the non-hesitation, not even a doubt in our mind when, when those guys stood up. I said, wait, we'll follow you. We'll follow you anywhere. Um, you know, as I reflect back and I've had some time to think about it, I don't know if I could have stood up that day. With everything going on, I don't know if someone running into a room and say, hey guys, let's take this bitch back if I'd be one of those five that could stand up and say, hey, I'll follow you anywhere. So to have that happen and to have, to see that firsthand, that guys just trusted, you know, just trusted in me to, to take them somewhere other than waiting for their, their demise in a barracks. can't even explain how, how proud and how honored I am to have those guys. So we, uh, we pushed out. We were able to, to recapture the ammo supply point, push the enemy off that position. Jones set up with his machine gun looking down the lock to the north. Delaney had a 240 squad automatic weapon. He had it pointed back toward the, uh, the south and the west looking back onto camp. Um, we started kicking ammo back to everyone else as quick as we could and get them resupplied. Then we started uh, getting into the knife fight with uh, the fighters that were on the, the cop over by the, the maintenance shed. What'd you call it? You call it a knife fight? Yeah, knife fight. 
you know, hand, hand to hand. We were kind of, kind of close. We were not. Yeah, we were. We, we, we ran out. Okay. Oh. We got up to the corner of the, the ammo supply point, uh, started pushing ammunition back to the uh, the guys uh, with Copus for his for his Mark 19 was a, a big priority to keep that gun in the fight. Um, he said we started getting into a, a pretty good knife fight there with Taliban fighters that were 20, 30 meters away um, in the camp. And, and they were all inside. They were all all over. Yeah like ants at a picnic. Um, as Jones is looking down the lock, uh, engaging fighters down there. Danley's on his near side security. The position we had him in, there was a big dead space where you couldn't see along uh, the road and the, the HESCO barriers, our, our perimeter, uh, basically sandbags. So Delaney is, you know, engaging guys inside a camp. I'm sitting there on the radio, coordinating back with uh, Lieutenant Bunderman. Danley, who's Jones's nearside security, looking north on the lock, we can hear him yelling, stop, no, don't, stop, stop. And I had one of my team leaders, Raz, there, and we kind of look at each other like, what, what the heck is Danley talking about? I come off my knee and I stand up and I look over the HESCO and I got a Taliban fighter. He's running up to Jones's position, taking his machine gun off his shoulder. Um, start yelling for everyone to get down, get down. I start blind firing over the top of my, over the top of the HESCO with my M4. And as Jones is trying to pull his machine gun and get back and. Dan Lee's trying to come down on the guy. He gets off a couple of rounds, and or Dan Lee takes one to his, his left shoulder. Raz, without missing a beat, he's already got the grenade with the pin pulled and the spoon popped. Just drops it right over the other side of the fence on him. Um, takes him out. I look over at Dan Lee, and his shoulder's blown pretty wide open. Put a pressure dressing on him, trying to stop the bleeding what we can. He can still, you know, walk and talk. So pretty, pretty decent amount of pain, and get him patched up, get him stood up, and basically tell him, "Hey, brother, you, you got to make it back to that point." Give him a shove and call him on the radio that they got a wounded coming into the aid station that needs treatment. Um, at that point, I realized that we were kind of losing our momentum able to establish that that point there um, we were starting to get some pretty decent air coverage coming in with the uh, the Apaches and uh, Jones was helping walk them on Jones and Raz were walking them on on guys they couldn't get direct fire uh, direct fire on with the machine gun well like I said realized we we're starting to lose momentum the enemy was getting uh, fixated on our position and I could tell they were, they were trying to keep us pinned down so we, we couldn't maneuver. They, they were trying to maneuver on us. So I called up Lieutenant Bunderman and let him know that I needed to keep moving. We couldn't stay here. Um, we had to keep pushing. We had to get the, the front gate closed because if we didn't get that closed, we couldn't, we couldn't keep them out of the wire. So the blue platoon was supposed to set uh, a support by fire machine gun to our south to try and interlock those fires so we can make that maneuver. And uh, they were pinned down on the backside um, and, and couldn't put it in position for us. So when I called up Lieutenant Bunderman to tell him I needed to move, he, he came back and said, you need to, you need to stand by and wait for that, that gun in there uh, to support you. I came back and I kept telling him I 
we really need to move. We're going to lose momentum. They're, they know what we're doing if we don't retake the, if we don't recapture the front gate and shut it. And he kept coming back and forth on, you know, just stand by, just wait, just wait. Um, so like the jerk of the NCO I was, I basically pulled the oldest trick in the book on a lieutenant. I acted like my radio was broke. I couldn't hear him telling me not to go. I told my guys, we're going to leave Jones there. Uh, we had another soldier uh, come out to take Dan Lee's spot, uh, Sergeant Scholes. So we're going to leave Jones and Scholes there to watch our backside. And uh, Miller, Delaney, Raz, and myself, we're going to come up, clear the Shira building, and uh, recapture the front gate. The entire time, Lieutenant Bunderman's calling me on the radio trying to get a response that I need to stand by. I'm just continuing to ignore him and I let the guys know, hey, are you guys ready for this? We're, we need to make this move. Uh, we're going to be exposed, uh, but we got to get in that building, get it cleared out. Uh, so Raz had a 203 on his M4. I was like, well, Raz, if you can come around the corner, I want you to fire a grenade into the building. Delaney had the, the squad automatic machine gun. I said, Raz is going to fire the 203. He's going to grenade the building. Once a grenade hits and goes off, Delaney, you're going to be the uh, first guy in with that machine gun. I want you to start from the left side, work right, just squeeze the trigger and sweep. I'll be right behind you to push you forward. Miller, you'll be the number three guy on the stack. And then Raz, you know, because he had just got done firing a 203, you'll be trail element, uh, rear security. So uh, Raz comes around, fires a grenade. We make the dash into the building. We get in there. Delaney just sweeps on through. We push and clear, make it to the, the door that accesses the, the front gate. Were there enemy in there? The sure they weren't directly inside. They were right outside the front door because they left us a couple of AKs and a, a nice uh, uh, medium machine gun that we uh, took from them. Because uh, at that point, you know, their their 7.62 machine gun they had there, uh, they kind of left as a present for us, was then the biggest gun I had in the fight. Because uh, before that, it was. Delaney with this saw that's only firing, you know, five, five, six, and you know, we needed a little heavier firepower, so uh, we were able to relieve them of, of those uh, weapons and got to the gate and was able to put it on lockdown. Uh, called back to Lieutenant Bunderman, let him know, hey, I'm got you back up on comms, but we're uh, we're here at the front gate. We got it. We got it secured. Uh, I think he, think he was highly upset and pleased at the same moment, knowing that we were able to pull off the maneuver, but I didn't quite listen to him like I probably should have. We get there, and like I said, we're establishing security, and I'm kind of realizing at this point that until I get the flank security set, you know, we, we really can't push anymore. Um, just too exposed, and there's too much going on. So I get on the radio and I'm able to, at this point, we got the close air support in. Fritchie is out of contact, so their 120 mortars can support us. That's the other uh, camp. Yeah, that was set on the, the hill to the south of us. Um, so I cor start coordinating fires, uh, indirect fires with the mortars and with the aircraft. Targets up on the mountains. I'm trying to stand far enough back in the door so you can just look out the doorway without getting shot, uh, try to keyhole it out. And I don't know how long we were there, whether it was 15 minutes or two hours. I'm sorry, you're in the Shura building at this point? At this point, we'd made it to the, the Shura building. Um, like I said, I don't know if we were there 15 minutes or two hours, but shortly, uh, Bunderman calls me on the radio and says, hey, brother, you won't believe this. But uh, we still got guys alive uh, up there at El Raz, too, where Gallegos was. 
said uh, Sergeant Larson and Carter are uh, still alive. Mace is badly wounded, uh, but he's still alive. Uh, we're going to bring in an airstrike on our mule if you guys can set a support by fire over on the putting green and the switchbacks. Uh, Larson and Carter are going to try and grab Mace, and as we coordinate the airstrike and you're covering fire, they're going to try and bring Mace back to the aid station. I said, yeah, we can make this happen. They bring in the, the bomber, starts dropping munitions. We launch out the front, set our support by fires, and start talking our machine guns back and forth up on the mountaintops on the, the hillsides. And Larson and Carter and Mace come down from El Raz 2, make their way along the side of the Shura, and come around the, uh, the ammo supply point and make it to the aid station. We come back, we withdraw back inside of the building, um, start setting our defense a, a little, little stiffer in there, and a little while later, uh, Larson calls me on the radio. I had just been checked out by the medics. They said, I'm good to go. Where are you at? Well, I'm out, out at the Shure building if you want to come join us. I said, well, I'll be there in a minute, but uh, if you need anything. I said, yeah, bring our, like I said, our drink of choice in our, our platoon was Dr. Pepper, and Larson always had a stash of Dr. Pepper. Um, <laughs> I was like, yeah, bring the Dr. Pepper. Dr. Pepper and bring my camel lights, my cigarettes, because I hadn't had a cigarette all day. A short while later, Larson shows up with a 12 pack of Dr. Pepper and a carton of my camel lights. I just couldn't believe he was, he was still standing there. So me and Larson had a lot of history together. He'd been my team leader for a long time. Uh, well, we took a break, took a moment, sparked up a cigarette. Cracked open a couple of Dr. Peppers. In the midst of everything going on, we just kind of hung out for a bit and powered down and drank a soda, and smoked, and got done. And then it was back to game on. Uh, Larson started kind of giving me the details of what had happened up there, where he had last seen Gallego sat, uh, what happened with Hart when he came up, and he told us that. Griffin's body was just outside the Shura building. They'd passed when they were taking Mace. Um, but he said he was just right out, right outside here. So uh, Sergeant Larson and Sergeant Rasmussen, you know, I called up to Lieutenant Bunderman and said, hey, we, we know where one of our fallen is. We're going to go extract him. Um, but Larson and Raz, You guys are gonna have to be quick. It's like I can't give you too too good a cover and fire, but we, we can cover you what you what we can. Um, Larson and Raz will said, "Look, look, we'll we'll drop everything except for our just our plates and our Kevlar." They left their weapon, left all their ammunition, left everything behind. And they made the dash outside and grabbed Griffin, brought him back in. Talk to me about why it's why it's. So important, critical that you save, bring back the fallen. It's one of those. <laughs> you want everyone to come back home. Um, I. Uh, used to tell my guys, look guys, we're, we're all going over together. Um, not everyone's coming back. Meaning uh, alive. But everyone is coming back. Um, my biggest fear, because the enemy had a tradition of doing it, was taking the bodies of soldiers and using it as propaganda. And it wouldn't be fair. 
and it wouldn't be right to never allow the families to have that closure, to have their, their you know, their soldier back, um, to say goodbye one more time. Um, you just never, <laughs> It's almost unimaginable to uh, sit there and think you're gonna leave anyone, no matter what. I mean, when a soldier gives up everything for, for another soldier, for the love of each other, It's only right to make sure they get properly uh, acknowledged and rewarded and to be brought back home to, to the people they love. You just can't leave. Can't even think about leaving someone behind, uh, no matter what the cost. So that's why you and Raz and Larson pushed up here to get your family. It was. So you've already told Johnny this story. They, like I said, when Larson came back, Griffin was the only one he knew where he was at. He'd lost contact with, uh, with Martin. He'd lost contact with Gallegos. Um, and he had not even the faintest clue of where Hart might be at this point. So as we, we recovered Griffin, I mean, that's, that was the elephant in the room. So we still got soldiers on Ocado for. We had enemy all over the side of camp for the last four or five hours. Um, and the last thing we want to do is leave someone. The last thing we want is to have the enemy have one of ours. Um, and the longer we waited, seemed like the more likely it would happen, or if it did happen, uh, the chances of, of recovering one would diminish quickly. Uh, so that's when I went back to Lieutenant Bunderman and told him once again, hey, we're, we're gonna push up. Uh, we're gonna find, we're gonna try and find Gallegos, we're gonna try and find Martin, we're gonna try and find Hart. Came up with another quick plan of I'd jump out with the team. We'd bound up um, as far as we could make it and with the intent of making it up to the mortar position because we'd found out that uh, Sergeant Breeding and, and his guys uh, were still up there. Uh, Thompson, uh, one of his mortar men, was one of the first ones killed that day during the initial attack. But uh, so there two soldiers that he had up there with him. Uh, they were they were still hanging in there. Um, so did you hear that over the radio, or how did you? How did you? He had. We'd finally get. <laughs> uh, breeding breeding. Sergeant breeding told me this later. Uh, he basically said, "Yeah, well, I I learned to shut up on the radio when you uh, came up with the plan to to counterattack, and the guy realized you're a little heated, so I wasn't going to tie up any more of the net space." Uh, Given updates, I was just going to shut up and let you talk. Because the only time you talk, Clint, is either when you're getting shot at or uh, you're getting really drunk. <laughs> so uh, I'll just, he's like, I just shut up and let you just go. He's like, I, if I needed something, I would have broke, broke on station and, and came through. But he's like, I just let you go. So for the longest time, yeah, I thought the, breeding, uh, the mortars had lost radio comms with us, but it was just Sergeant so Breeding just, hey, they were hanging tight. And, they had bunkered down and were in a pretty good position considering, uh, and we're just waiting. So uh, I said, came up with a plan. We're hopefully gonna try and make it up to Sergeant Breeding uh, to extract them, to kind of bring them back. Because at the same time, we didn't know, you know when the QRF was gonna show up. They had uh, the, the quick reaction force coming to, to reinforce us. 
you know, and at this time it had been eight hours into the battle. Um, the quick reaction force, our our, uh, our support, you know, had weather they couldn't get out of uh, to launch from. Helicopters couldn't get up in the, the air because of the bad weather. Uh, they also had to get dropped off at Opie Fritchie because they couldn't drop them low where we were at. They, they weren't going to make it. Uh, so they had to get dropped at Opie Fritchie and, OP Fritchie, and then they were going to clear and walk down on us. Uh, but we just didn't know how long that was going to take. Um, so, uh, like I said, we were, the longer I looked at it, the longer, longer we waited to go push out to link up with breeding and, and try and recover all of our fallen heroes, the less likely would have a chance of finding them. Um, sort of in a condensed way to the the thing of first learning the enemy was inside and the sense of oh my god we're all going to die here <laughs> right or that it could happen right yeah. that it was negative it was all it was all downward you know sort of event right yeah. and how how important it is to push through the yeah. counterattack in that in that situation. It was within the first hour, maybe a little more of the fight, that uh, the enemy had breached our wire, uh, was inside our camp. Uh, like I said, the, the Afghan National Army had abandoned the whole eastern side of the camp. So the first uh, first wave of fighters pushed right in through there and started the fires in the barracks um, and was trying to push in on our eastern flank. Uh, and then when the uh, the front gate basically got overran and they, they couldn't maintain it, uh, our forces had to displace out of there um, and the enemy had a open shot right right through our front gate to to, to come in on us. You know, when I first heard the call come across, and then when I first seen you know, the enemy in the wire, it was one of those, you know, this seems like something straight out of a movie. Um, this couldn't really be happening, but it is. Um, but it was also to the point of, You know, we were we were taking a lot that day, but we just knew that. I mean, the American spirit and the American soldier. We don't just roll over and and call it quits. You know, when I walked into the barracks and I kind of seen the looks on on some of the guys' faces. They just needed a spark because um, they had it in them. They just needed just a spark to ignite, to get them angry, to, to push back. Because uh, when, you, when you quit fighting or when you think you've, you've lost, you have. There's no, you can't tip the scale back after you start thinking that. Once you think that you're lost, you, are, you already are. Um, and that day it was very much, we weren't beat, we weren't even close to being beat. Uh, even in the midst of them overrunning us, even in the midst of knowing we had positions that were isolated, we couldn't get to them, knowing that we we're taking heavy casualties and knowing that we were almost out of ammunition, we still had more fight left in the tank and we knew we could we could keep going, and they literally would have had to extinguish the life out of every one of us 
before we were done. Because you can't go into a fight thinking, I might not come out of this. Uh, you you got to go there and without doubt in your heart, just know that you're going to give it everything you got and you're going to come out on top. Um, and to see to see some of my soldiers there that day, to know these guys were just doing what they got trained to do. They were just doing a job. For me, that was my motivator. I was just doing my job, and I didn't want to let them down by not doing it because they were doing everything in their power, doing theirs. Um, and you didn't want to disappoint them. And you just wanted to, to be there to support each other and know that when a unit comes together and when you've got teamwork driving the fight, you're unbeatable. No matter what the odds, it, it goes so far. Take me back for a second to you were like the, just like a refrain through the early stages of the battle of got to get to Gallegos. You know, uh, so when the initial attack happened and we got isolated right away from Southern Gallegos in that position, it was one of those, I mean, I could see his position. He, they were right there, um, 150, maybe 200 meters away. I mean, so when you, when you just think about it, you you know they're a football field and a half away. That was it. Um, but you just couldn't get to them. Um, the amount of fire coming down in on you, as as much as you think you can make that dash, and you know they're just right there, and uh, you can't be that close without thinking you can do something. But there was a point where, until we got the close air support and uh, the indirect fire, you couldn't do much. But I knew if our roles were reversed, if I was out there at that Humvee and Gallegos was back where I was, without hesitation, Gallegos would have done everything in his power to come try and get me. Um, and that's all I was trying to do for him, to repay him for, for an act I know he would do. And that's, I mean, the motivator of, of everything is you do what you know they do for you. So, I don't know whether you had kind of finished the narrative about the, the battle, but basically it was kind of, you were, I guess, recovered We had made, made the final push and we were able to, we found Sergeant Martin's body. Uh, we were able to bring him back. Uh, we found Gallegos. Was able to bring him back. Um, but we didn't find Hart at first. And the way the plan was, as we pushed up to the mortar position, Blue Platoon was supposed to, to run an element um, on the southern side and then we'd link up just before we hit the mortars. We pushed out. Blue wasn't able to make their move. By the time we, we pushed up and we were able to get to where uh, Larson had thought he'd last seen Gallegos or the area was in, we were, were stretched out and um, we didn't have the cover or the firepower to, to keep up the fight. I mean, we were pushing up the, or pushing up the hill with five guys at that point again. Uh, five guys to go up, uh, grab one of the fallen, uh, and try and run them back. So uh, Lieutenant Bunderman had called and realized we were stretched too thin and told us to reconsolidate, that 
we could we could secure the area now with the close air support. We we had a good foothold now back on our defense perimeter, or perimeter defense, um, and to hold what we got. QRF was only an hour or so away at that point, maybe maybe two hours away, uh, to hold what we got. And the entire time I was thinking, we didn't find heart. And it was getting to the point, we're going back and forth on the radio for a bit with Lieutenant Bunderman about the likelihood of thinking Hart was no longer on the, uh, the, the cop anymore. To the point of, I told him, hey, <laughs> I'm just going to make the mad dash and just start running all around and maybe I can Maybe I can find him or, or something. And Lieutenant Bunderman and the guys had talked me out of, of doing something like that because they'd looking out for me and understanding the, the likelihood of <laughs> making a single dash all over the cop and coming back was probably pretty slim. But how did you find her? As So Hertz uh, truck was up near the Humpy. Really? Did it make it close to the to the to Gallegos's Humpy? They had made it about five feet apart from his final resting spot of, of that Humvee. Uh, that Humvee had kind of gotten hung up as Hart was pushing up there on a building that had partially gotten blown over and it got the truck mired as they, they made their push. They were high centered and couldn't move. Um, but as darkness was falling, just as it was getting dark, the QRF came off the mountain, started uh, using our IR lasers or infrared lasers doing visual link up uh, to establish where they knew where our friendly positions were. And as the QRF came in, they started clearing the areas we, we couldn't get to. Um, and so they started doing a, clear, uh, a clearance on through. Then we did a, a face to face link up. And on their push in, they're able to find Hart a um, little ways away from the Humvee. He'd, he'd made it after the Humvee had gotten hit, it appeared, and it made it for a while before he succumbed to his, his wounds. Uh, and finally, almost 13 hours later, 12, 13 hours later, we finally had 100% um, accountability on, on our soldiers which was, like I said, when the, the QRF came across the radio and said they had found Hart, just the, the relief to finally know that everyone was gonna get to come home that night, that, that no one was gonna be left. Well, it's amazing to think starting at 6 o'clock in the morning that you had the odds were <laughs> so stacked against you. I mean, really. It could have, it could have, as bad as it was, it could have been worse. Right? It could have been a lot worse. Oh, like I said, it was, had a g great group of guys there that just, <laughs> yeah, they just weren't going to quit. And they're just going to keep feeding off each other. Uh, not out of not out of hatred for what was going on with the enemy trying to kill them, but just out of pure love for one another. That's what <laughs> really the driving force that day was. Yeah, you were getting angry because of what was happening, but when you really looked at it, you just. You just did it for your brother to your left and your right. Just didn't want to let anybody down. So, <clears throat> how long before Cop Keating got shut down? We spent uh, another four days up there. Uh, 
I said when the, the enemy had breached our wire, uh, they started burning down a lot of our buildings. <laughs> so by the time, by the time the QRF got there that night, we'd lost about 70% of the outpost uh, due to fire or, or explosions. And then we spent the next three days um, basically recovering anything of use, uh, weapons, sensitive items uh, that we could bring back that wasn't too, too badly uh, destroyed. And then we just started prepping the outpost with what was left for uh, uh, demolition. And at the uh, end of the, it was the fourth night when we left, when we took off, that's when they popped the fuse with everything charged up and we got on the aircraft and left out of there. And popped the fuse as in blew, blew up what was remaining? Blew up what was, because the Humvees and stuff originally had gotten drove up there back years and years before, but now the road up there was so, such in bad shape, you couldn't lift them out with the helicopter because they were too heavy. Um, but yeah, we'd, we'd left kind of knowing that probably would never, never see that place again. Uh, -huh. but it was, what well, was more, really more amazing, uh, especially on a leader's perspective and standpoint. I said, we lost four guys directly out of my platoon. Um, Kirk Gallegos. Mason Hart, three of them were team leaders, E5s, huge, huge personalities in our platoon uh, as far as leadership. Uh, Mace, you know, he was an up and coming soldier that had all the potential in the world of being a, a great leader someday. Uh, when we got back to Bostic, like I said, to, to look at it from my perspective as a leader, we had nine more months left in country. I mean, we weren't even close to being out of the woods yet. We lost four guys. But to see the guys in my platoon and first platoon pick up, you know, put it kind of in their back pocket and carry it with them, but not let it affect the rest of their time to understand we still had a mission to do, that we still had to, to drive on and to see the younger soldiers that you know totally loved the leadership that Kirk and Gallegos and Hart had demonstrated and to see them step into those positions to fill that void to incorporate the new guys we came in that came in for replacements to 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 get our numbers and our platoon back up to fighting strength to see our guys incorporate them just as brothers in arms always do, uh, without hesitation or, or without, you know, disdain of, well, you weren't there at Cop Keating. No, to, to fully welcome and incorporate them. And, you know, I told the guys, look, we do have nine more months left, and we can't, we can't sit here on this one day and, and lick our wounds and forget what we're here doing. We, we still need to watch out for each other because we're not out of the woods. And when we get back stateside, that's when we can take a sigh of relief and take a knee, um, and we could relax a little. Like I said, we got back and hit the ground running again, and these, these soldiers, man, no hesitation in their hearts, just kept on driving after all of that, where, where so many others would would sit there and throw their hands up and say, enough is enough. I, I've done my time or I, I've paid my dues. Now these guys always had more to give. And like I said, they didn't do it for, for paychecks. They didn't do it for tennis shoe endorsements. They did it just strictly out of respect and love for each other. So jump me ahead to your, your bank in the States. Tell me about how you heard Right, so you're back 
back in North Dakota. Uh, tell me about how you heard that you were being recommended for uh, Initially, after uh, the actions happened, my command group actually had put me in for a Distinguished Service Cross. Um, at the time, you know, I told them that <laughs> that's something that Gallegos and, and Larson um, and Mace and, and Hart, that's, I, didn't, I didn't really do anything special. I just did my job that day and, you know, they kind of talked to me for a bit and I, I basically told them, look, uh, I don't really care uh, what award you put me in for. Um, I just want to continue mission. You know, and I talked to my guys about the award system and, and that also about, you know, it doesn't, you know what you did in your heart. Um, it's great to be acknowledged and recognized, but when it truly comes down to it, it's, it's what, what's in your heart. So when I got back to the States, uh, got out of the military, went to go work up in North Dakota. And of course, I'd keep in contact with some of my buddies and, you know, I'd, a few of them had called me up and we'd been talking a few times and they'd tell me well so and so that knows general so and so that walks the dog of the guy who knows the other guy that makes his coffee said uh, they're recommending you for upgrade and told them, well, <laughs> not really paying too much attention to that uh, whatever it's you know is what it is um, and for a long time I, I know a lot of my buddies were were pretty upset because uh, they would call me and they'd ask, "Hey, have you ever gotten any acknowledgement for that day?" And I'd tell them, "No, I don't. I'm kind of working right now. It's not really on my priority list." And they'd be upset that, "Well, did you know have you gotten your your DSE or your silver?" No, I, I don't know what's going on with it. Finally, one day I got a call. A number I didn't recognize at work so I answered it and the uh, voice on the other end of the line you know identified himself as a colonel out of the Pentagon and um, he had something to talk to me about but he couldn't talk to me on the phone he uh, <laughs> wanted me to come out to DC uh, so they could do it in person so I kind of sat there and I told him well you know I'd haven't been working at this job too long and I don't have enough vacation days to take off, so I'll get back in touch with you. For a couple of weeks there, I just, and I told my wife that I'd gotten this call and I kind of thought it was about, you know, an award or something, but, you know, it was kind of, other things were going on with in, in my life of getting reestablished in the civilian world and, and work and so finally, Gave the colonel a call back and told him, well, you know, I talked to my boss and he said, yeah, I could, I could take a couple of days off and come out to, to D.C. And I said, okay, well, we'll get it all set up. First time in, I mean, wasn't even, I was out of the military, so I can't say the first time in my military career, but it's the first time I've ever seen travel orders cut in less than a week. Um, and Less than a week later, I had tickets and everything to, to fly out here to D.C. I show up, and the colonel picks me up at the airport, get introduced finally face-to-face -face in person, and says, well, I'll take you to your hotel, but first we're going to stop by the Pentagon, uh, knock out some formalities. It's okay. Jump on the, the metro, go straight over to the Pentagon, they take me in and start meeting a couple of one star and two star and three star generals. Kind of thinking to myself, man, I must <laughs> really be in trouble because normally if I'm seeing anything more in a company commander, that means I messed up pretty bad or something. They finally take me into a conference room. They set me down and they've got, you know, a couple of one and two stars and they got the public affairs people and this person and that person, I'm not even really sure who's all in the room at this point. Someone starts talking. 
I wasn't really paying too much attention. And as I sat down, there's three posters in front of me. One's Leroy, one's Sal Junta, and then one's Sergeant Sabo, uh, Vietnam reci recipient posthumously. I'm sitting there and I'm looking and it's Medal of Honor, Medal of Honor. And they're continuing to talk and I'm not paying no mind to it. I'm just sitting there looking at these three posters. And I finally look up and I call a timeout. And everyone kind of gets quiet and I, I look back down and I'm like, you know, what, what is this? Uh, you know, this is Medal of Honor. Um, I was like, I, I know originally or something they talked about putting me in for DSC and so I don't know why you guys are showing me this. And Someone from kind of the crowd spoke up and said, well, you don't know. I said, no, I, I don't know. That's why I'm asking a question. Well, you've been recommended for upgrade. Um, it's been approved all the way up. It's just waiting for the president's signature. <laughs> kind of looked back down and looked back up and I said, well, <laughs> Why me? It's like I just just doing a job that day and said I can think of eight other guys that uh deserve this. And uh just kinda shut up at that point and let them keep talking for a while and finally got done with that. That's when they took me over to go see uh General Foley. I went over to his office. General Foley was a Vietnam recipient. He set me down and we had a got to sit there and talk for a while. That kind of put things into perspective, getting that mentorship and uh, and that help from, you know, another soldier. So <clears throat> <laughs> so, um, so you found out you were brought to Washington. You, you must have sensed something was going on, and finally you got it out of them. They told you, right? But you did not. You didn't want. You didn't feel that you were worthy somehow. I mean, or that it was not right. You know, it was was one of those mixed emotions of, you know, you're, you're honored to be recognized for your actions. But, like I said, we got eight other guys I know that deserve this. Um, I got to come home and, and they didn't. Um, I seen a lot of action that day from a lot of different people that what they did was so heroic um, and amazing that, and I know you can't just blanket everything and put it under one one stroke of a pen, but me personally, I just felt, you know, there's so many deserving guys out there. Um, and if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. So when I wear this, yeah, I know I, I got selected to wear it, but I tell you what, it's it's for those guys. It's for all those those soldiers that have served wars past, the current conflicts, the future wars. It's it's not my award. I'm just blessed enough to be able to be here to tell their story and share their story, um, and wear it for them. You're, you're out there, you're working some, uh, what was your job in North Dakota and you were just... I was working uh, as a 
field rep safety specialist. So I was out at, it was one of our, it was our pipeline job we were doing at the time. And I get this random call to, hey, can you come back to DC? And it was kind of one of those, you know, you don't really get one of those every day uh, for an invite to come out to the Pentagon. Um, but ended up taking them up on their offer and coming out to DC. And, and when they sent me down to, to tell me, like I said, I'd kind of just, wouldn't say I forgot about it, but it was one of those kind of back of my mind with everything else going on. So, you know, that was the first time it had gotten mentioned and kind of brought to the forefront for me. Uh, like I said, I'd heard some rumors and stuff, but until then, I mean, wasn't even kind of on my radar. And they told you, finally they told you <laughs> that you were being put up for another night. Yeah, they'd said after I'd, they were sitting there talking and I'd kind of had my head spinning and called the timeout and asked for clarification. And they told me, yeah, you've been recommended for upgrade. Um, other than the president signing the, the last piece of paper, you'll be receiving the Medal of Honor. Um, then went back to head kind of spinning again and kind of reflecting on the, the other guys that were there with me that day. What was it like? Talk, describe for me the meeting the president and, and the actual awards ceremony. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, when uh, we went to the White House, um, had Sorry. when we uh, when we went to the White House to go uh, for the ceremony and, and meet the president, I had all of my kids with me, my three kids. So for me. Uh, a little bit nervous about having a at the time a two-year-old and a four-year-old running all over the White House. Uh, uh, we went into the Oval Office to meet the President and the First Lady. My two little ones, Colin and Gwen, are you know, jumping on the furniture, they're running around, and the entire time I'm just thinking to myself that they are gonna break something <laughs> and I'm gonna have to pay for it and, you know, uh, it's kind of an awkward position to be in where you're, your kids are, you know, just being kids, but they're, they're doing it inside the Oval Office with the President and First Lady. Um, but they were, I mean, President and First Lady were very just honored to, to have the kids in there and picking through the apples. And <laughs> I think they were, they were more entertained than I think me and my wife were, but uh, sat in there and chit-chatted with the president for a bit. And he did the, the final signature, and you know I had my parents in there, and my wife had her parents in there. And we headed out to go to the ceremony. And I don't remember a lot uh, being up on stage. I don't really remember too much of what was said. I just remember kind of looking out into the crowd and seeing, you know, most of my battle buddies that were there with me that day were able to make it for the ceremony and seeing them standing up and getting their acknowledgement for their service that day. Seeing the families of the, uh, of the eight soldiers we lost. Seeing them there. And seeing their acknowledgement and be able to share with them, you know, another chapter in their lives as they continue on after all they've been through. I was humbled to be in their presence because they had sacrificed so much. And then to see my family that was able to come and just being able to <clears throat> just being able to share the moment with them. Your father must have been very proud. He was <laughs> like I said, there's not a whole lot said uh, between us Roe Mache boys. And in fact, 
I didn't really even tell my dad about it until about a month before the ceremony. Just because I didn't want him to, to worry or... I don't, I don't know why, really. I just... It had to be a response <clears throat> once, you, once you learned. Kind of think, <laughs> think he was kind of upset that I kind of never came out and told him right away. Um, and I know he was proud. And I know he understood, though. Who it was for. That it wasn't done for a selfish act of recognition. You know, he had, he had been in combat. He knows what love for your fellow man really means and, and where camaraderie comes into play. I, I, I know he was proud. But also know, you know, that what him, my dad, my grandfather, and the values they taught me growing up sees where it kind of paid off, I guess. Talk to me about the, uh, <clears throat> have you had much exposure to the, this character development program? Yeah. I've done a, a few of the events out of Gainesville last year. Uh, and I haven't had a direct, uh, you know, I haven't had a direct path into the character development to, to be in the schools yet. Uh, but to be working alongside the program, one of the, the things I'm trying to establish is there's no CDP in North Dakota at all. Uh, they, the school system there runs a uh, program called Character Counts already in kind of their curriculum, but I'm working with the, uh, the superintendent at a, at a Minot. <laughs> Um, to look at the, uh, the society CDP program and to get it established there. Uh, when I first got told about the CDP, I was blown away. Um, I know as a, as a kid, you know, I had the benefit of having a, a strong family to, to rally around and, and to get some, some values instilled in me from the get. And I can see in today's, today's age that you know, it seems like we're, we're shifting more to priorities. Um, and as I tell, tell people that priorities can always change, but values are always constant. And the values that the character development brings into schools for, for kids that might never get exposed to just simple messages of, of honor and integrity and patriotism and selfless service and sacrifice, those are values that our country was founded on. It's what keeps this country going. Um, and when we forget that, we start losing our path as a nation. Uh, and, and what the society has done to give back after they've given so much already. Uh, you just want to rally behind the colors uh, and to keep it going forward. Keep pushing it into the future. Because as soon as we forget our history, as soon as we forget our sacrifices, that's too late. We're already too far down the road, already too deep in trouble to, to turn it around. So I'm going to ask you to <clears throat> include the whole phrase. Oh, another slate? Right. Yeah. I, I want to. Um, but that was used to acronyms. <laughs> nicely put. Yeah, no, got it.
Okay, so what do you what do you think about this? What you've heard, what you've seen so far related to this character development program, and is there? A, I guess the question is. Are the the values that you saw acted upon on the, on that day, October third, two thousand nine? Can those be repeated? Is that is it is it really purely a military reality, that kind of brotherhood, or can it can it mean something? You know, in the in the broader world, like, or people who were, for instance, never in the military. No, the, the great thing about the character development program is it teaches kids, it teaches all of us that you don't have to don a uniform for, for service or sacrifice or honor or integrity. Uh, I just happened to, to wear one uh, when the actions happened for me that day, but I, you see it all over. and. You see service above self and, and everyday people that have never worn the uniform, and that's what the character development program brings to light. That it doesn't matter where you're from or, or what you're doing, it's just the simple act of reacting. When you see, the, when you see a need, when you see a challenge, when you see an opportunity, do you sit there and just let it pass you by? Or do you stand up and say, hey, this is the right thing to do, and go do it? That's what the character development program shows all walks of life, whether you're military, civilian, or in between. Citizen honors part of it. Citizens service before self honors, but citizen honors is good enough. Uh, I guess has now been. It's about 2008 when it got started, uh, and you're going to see some of these folks tomorrow recognized. What's the value of recognizing? And tell me what it is, right? <laughs> I mean, like this is the society decided to rec recognize civilians. What's the value of doing that with the citizen honors? No, that the citizens' honors is is our way of giving back, to to acknowledge, you know, that sacrifice and and determination that you see throughout this country. Um, you know, we as recipients of the Medal of Honor get acknowledged for actions, um, but understand that it you didn't seek out for. For the attention, you didn't seek it out for the uh, the exposure. You did it because it was what you felt was right, what you knew was right. And the citizens' honors there. There are so many people out there that have done heroic and brave things because they knew it was the right thing to do. They did it because they the love of their fellow man, uh, their love of their country. And to acknowledge that, that just because you don't have the uniform on, I, I find that even more heroic. You know, when I, when I rose my right arm and volunteered for service, like my father had told me, I, I knew what I could get into. Uh, what was the citizen's honors? When you see just regular citizens every day on the street that go above and beyond the call of duty to help their fellow man, for nothing other than just their love and and doing the right thing. Um, it is so inspiring. And to be able to acknowledge and give that back, uh, it would be a shame if we didn't. Um, stories about your, your guys? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me about, um, I mean, it seems like Chris Jones is quite a, a character. <laughs> uh, I, 
think one of the <coughs> one of the best ones was Sergeant Larson and, and Raz they decided to go out and uh, I wouldn't say kidnap, but I would say coerce one of the uh, the goats um, into coming into our barracks. Our platoon leader, Lieutenant Bunnerman, was we slept in these little almost cubicles in the barracks. Uh, so, I mean, they were just barely wide enough to walk in and have a bed in this kind of little bowling alley of a looking thing. So Raz and Larson <laughs> collect up this goat from the locals that was eating grass, you know, inside the, the outpost that day. And they snuck it into the room. Uh, and Bunderman had just gotten off uh, as, uh, officer of the guard the night before. So he'd stayed up all night and it's the middle of the day. So he, he's catching up on his sleep. And he's in there racked out. And Raz and Larson come in with this goat, shove it right into his little hut. <laughs> then they used the card table we'd play spades on to barricade it in. Of course, the goat lets off a little ba and Bunderman wakes up and sitting there just flipping out on the goat, staring at him. We pull the curtain back and he's, you know, a grown adult with a baby goat just, just off the side of him. He's trying to shield himself behind his pillow, yelling at the goat to get out of there, <laughs> thinking that was the most horrific thing you could ever do to a man. Finally, of course, we, we put that one on video. We had to capture that one. <laughs> but uh, they returned the goat safely to its rightful owners. But uh, we let Bunderman know that you know, we might not think too much less of him, but when you cower behind a, bit, a pillow with a baby goat in your room, that's not quite the manliest thing to be doing. <laughs> We should, uh, you, you've got a copy of that video. Oh, yeah. That's that's a keeper. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's got to leak out at some point. I also want to get uh, a moment that I've heard described. Um, it was when you had the Russian sniper rifle, and you're, I, I guess you're helping Kappas sort of protect himself. <laughs> and and you see these guys, these enemy combatants, just sort of walking through, parading through the, the grounds like they own it. Not talk to me about that. Said I'd grabbed the, uh, the sniper rifle coming out of the aid station. I'd went over to Copus because uh, he was taking the, the shots on his, on his sick side. I was bouncing back and forth and kind of neutralized that threat. And I was coming back to the aid station and by our aid station, we kind of had a little overhang. We had sandbags kind of piled up. And I could look over in the direction about where Gallegos was, but because of a connex, you couldn't get a straight line of sight from that position. But from that position, though, as you looked across, you could see the edge of the Shura building. So you couldn't see the gate because the building was blocking the way. And I remember standing there for a bit, and it was just trying to put things in perspective is what I was trying to do, is trying to paint the picture and wrap my head around what our next move was. From the corner of the Shura building, I see three Taliban fighters just walk through. I walked into the, the cop a little ways, and there was a Humvee that was sitting there that we had to abandon because they, they couldn't hold it anymore. And the, the cruiser of a weapon was disabled and they were out of ammunition. And these three fighters walk up and just right behind it, sat down. One had the, the RPG and the other two had AKs and the guy with the RPG takes it off the shoulder and just kind of sets it there and they're, they're relaxing on the back of the Humvee like the game's over, they're, they've already won. And I mean, they're less than probably 100 meters away. And I'm sitting there, and I mean, they have no idea I'm, I'm standing there. And I'm thinking to myself, I've got a sandbags that are, you know, about shoulder level. I've got a high-powered sniper rifle, and I got a less than 100 meter shot. I've got a stable platform. <laughs> so I throw the, the rifle up on the sandbags, 
And I look over, and to my left, <clears throat> there were the two Laffian Army soldiers, uh, called them Lucky and, and Martin. And I look over to them, and I kind of look back, and I said, are, are you seeing this? And they start coming over, and they look. And I'm thinking to myself, this is, you know, they just strolled in here like nothing. And then they're going to stand here and give me basically a gibby shot. So I pull down on the, the guy with the RPG and fire the first round, go to the second guy, fire the second round. By then, Lucky and, Lucky and Martin come up uh, next to me, and the third guy is squirting around the back of the Humvee. And so we're keeping him pinned down. Lucky, like I said, one of the, the Latvian soldiers that was with us, big guy. Huge, huge man. Real thick accent, though. I'm sorry. We're going to have to. I'll, I'll just ask you one of your questions. Mark. It'll help. Okay. Your thing. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to convince, like, this? It's, it's almost like you live a, a few lifetimes in one day. I mean, we're talking 12 or 13 <laughs> hours. Is it possible to? draw that down, or just impossible, really? I mean, it's, I feel like when I try and condense, you know, a 12-hour firefight into a couple of par paragraphs, it's, it's, it's tough, um, you know, because there's so many guys there doing so many great things, and I, I don't want to leave those guys out uh, or, you know, forget to acknowledge what they did. Through the, the course of the day, you know, it seemed pretty simplistic on the events that kind of were the, the highlight points or the, uh, you know, kind of where the, the tides got turned. Um, trying, to, trying to go up and, and support Gallegos and, and getting them out, you know, just to get hit with an RPG, you know, kind of detoured that, that event. To come back and to, to see Sergeant Hart, like I said, uh, going back and forth with him and, and knowing that I wasn't going to be able to tell him no and he was going to go up and get Gallegos. Um, and knowing that was the last time I was going to see him, to see him push up there, uh, do everything he could to support that position. Um, to the call coming across the radio that they got an RPG pointed right at me, and that's the last we heard from Hart. To, to coming back and, and see an enemy just rolling through our camp like, like they, they own, own the joint, like victory was theirs, um, and putting a stop to that to the point of realizing we needed ammo to keep going and having a, a volunteer of five guys without hesitation launch out on a counter assault with me um, to get the ammo and push the ammo back and then to push up again to shut the front gate so the enemy couldn't keep pushing in on us and, and one of the most important actions done that day was those guys pushing out and, and recovering the fallen heroes that we had lost and finally having accountability of every one of them so everyone could come home. So I'm going to draw, you know, a sort of distinction that may not be accurate, but that a certain amount of your, like, there is the passion and the fury of the moment, <laughs> right? And then there's, you know, occasional kind of moments of clarity about <laughs> what should happen, could happen. That's more strategic. Um, I guess, in a way, it's the uh, the fog. <laughs> a lot of it is the fog of war. Yeah. Right? And it, talk to me about the fog of war and those occasional moments of clarity. I mean, certainly the decision, the plan to retake. You know. It's the Shira building and close off the front gate. That was 
that was like fog, set, clear, <laughs> seemingly clearing a little bit. Talk to me about that difference. You know, it's sort of reflect back on that day. Like I said, certain things are are clear. Uh, certain times, like I said, seem to to slip on by, and certain times seem to just last forever. Um, you know, and as I, I kind of recount the actions of the day, you know, in the moment of just strategically looking at things, uh, always been pretty clear about kind of visualizing an action or what I would like to see happen before it happens. Uh, but then when you start thinking about some of the, the stressful emotional positions being put in and and reflecting back to when you made a split second decision that right wrong or indifference you knew you had to make one and now having the hindsight to look at the consequence and action of that you know comes comes with a lot of haze and hesitation at times um, and it's almost and I'm not a psychologist or anything by no means I almost feel like some of it's just your body's natural defense mechanism for for what you've experienced in your life. Like I said, when I when I look back to that day, I you know, I, I've got a lot of painful moments, but the large majority of them is just victorious, just happy moments of guys volunteering without hesitation. Guys they just kept putting one foot in front of the other and kept going, you know, remembering the positive things that happened that day, remembering the great things that they accomplished. Uh, and that's what I like to try and concentrate and focus on, um, the positives. Because, yeah, not saying the negatives never happen, but, I mean, I'm just the type of person I'd rather reflect on the good stuff than, than the bad um, and just keep going.